Ah, Lego Swords. Essential features of Castle and Fantasy Mock since the launch of the theme back in 1978. Since then, Lego has produced many more variations of the medieval weapons, some great and some questionable. In this video, we'll go through each Lego sword, discuss its merits and flaws, and attempt to settle the age-old question, with what arms shall your valiant minifigs defend their blocky kingdom from certain doom? My main focus is on the Lord of the Rings and other fantasy slash castle mocks, so while we'll discuss the more unusual swords of Ninjago, Chima, and Nexo Knights, they will receive less attention. Let's dive in with the OG sword, the short sword. Featured in the Yellow Castle in countless sets since, this is probably the most prolific of the LEGO swords. Sadly, it's not the best of representations. The obvious flaw is that this sword has zero stabbing potential, and this rounded off point just looks silly. Its only pro is that the crossguard can be held by a minifigure. I'm not sure why you'd want to do this, but it's something that's unique to this sword, so I figured it was worth mentioning. Overall, this sword is a solid 2 out of 10. Next up is the Pirate Cutlass, which is basically the opposite story. First released in 1989, this still holds up today as an excellent weapon. Sharp, thin, light, and small, as a Pirate Cutlass was. The fact that this sword is widely used today is a testament to its excellent design, and it shouldn't go away anytime soon. Another iconic and near flawless sword is the Katana. First produced in 1998 for the Ninja line, the Katana does everything it needs to do, and has been featured widely in Castle and Ninjago sets ever since. Again, a design that holds up to this day. The Katana un did undergo a slight modification in the late 2000s, where the octagonal grip was changed to a square one. Whether this is an improvement or not is up for debate, but the difference is barely noticeable, so I don't think people cared too much either way. Next was the Scimitar, made for the Warriors of the Orient in the Adventurer's theme circa 2003. It later found a home in the Ninjago sets of 2013, but seems to have fallen out of favor with LEGO designers since then. While the sword itself was designed well for its time, it's a bit more niche, and in my opinion always was a bit too bulky. Probably its biggest plus is the open stud in the pommel permitting it to serve as the sharp end of a polearm. While there was a lot of success in the early days of LEGO Swords, none of these winners filled one of the primary needs in the community, a quality representation of European swords. There were two attempts made. First, the King's Sword, or Great Sword Round. This design, while impressive even today for its imposing crossguard and massive blade, still suffered from the round end of its predecessor. The other attempt, titled the Great Sword Angular, also had that rounded point, but distinguished itself by its unique crossguard, which offers customization options to army builders that prior swords did not. Both the Knight's Kingdom and Viking themes utilized this sword, but it fell out of production after 2006. So the Dark Ages of LEGO weapons settled in. Interrupted briefly by the Kopesh sword in the Pharaoh's Quest line, and the Scimitar with Nyx in the 2009 Castle line. Ninjago introduced the Sword of Fire in 2011, a modified katana with a dragon's head around the hilt, which was great for Ninjago, but insufficient for the high fantasy fans. But relief finally came with the release of the late 2011 Lord of the Rings sets. The world of Middle-earth brought three primary weapons, the Great Sword Pointed, the Gladius, and the Urukai Sword. All three offered realistic swords that actually came to a point, served a diverse set of needs, and were totally sufficient for the aspirations of most fans at the time. I remember getting these as a little kid and thinking they were the coolest thing ever. The narrower blade on the greatsword pointed and the gladius made them so much better than the nearly brick-thick blades of prior swords, and the Urukai sword was perfectly accurate to the movies. There was also a sting dagger, which was a little disproportionate, but daggers were never very good in that department, and it represented the movie sword quite well with the crossguard and pommel shaping. I could go on, but you get the idea. The Lord of the Rings sets brought about the second great age of Lego swords. But as we know, the Lord of the Rings sets died as quickly as they came, and most sword innovations slammed to a halt. Given how great the Middle-earth swords were, this wasn't a huge problem. Ninjago continued to produce new weapons, but they were mostly elemental effect blades and not suitable for massive army building. Chima brought a variety of new swords as well, but their bulk and accommodation for lightsaber blades in the core made them similarly challenging. And I don't even want to talk about Minecraft. Also during this time, we saw an update to the OG short sword with a more elaborate hilt design, but since the broad, stubby, and rounded blades stayed the same, this sword was largely disrespected, and soon forgotten. Nexo Knights brought the next stab at sword upgrades with the sword blade with bar. In my opinion, this sword piece has huge potential in a dwarven army, but it never seemed to catch on with mock builders. It was also overshadowed by the main Nexo Knights power swords, which were dual molded with both rubber and plastic, and featured translucent cores to the blades. Additionally, the Nexo Knight swords were massive, standing taller than the average minifig. Because of this, these swords made little sense in anything other than a Nexo Knight's build, and the Lord of the Rings weaponry remained supreme. 
One all-gray power sword appeared in an Excalibur Batman set, but the bulk of the weapon and rarity of his set prevented it from becoming mainstream. Then in 2020 came the minifigure Series 20 Tournament Knight, and with him the great sword with curved crossguard. This weapon brought two changes to LEGO swords that, for better or worse, will probably continue from here on out. First, the hard rubber material was replaced for standard plastic. I think this is a huge tragedy, because I modified a couple of my Lord of the Rings great swords and was pretty happy with the versatility of the rubber pieces. On the flip side, durability keeps the swords from being bent when in a massive LEGO bin. The other change was more stylistic, the inclusion of a blood groove. This sword was used in the great medieval blacksmith, the massive lion's castle, and now the Lord of the Rings Brickheads. Interestingly, it was not included in the new Rivendell set, and that leads us to the state of LEGO swords today. Rivendell included a pack of all new swords, and they are all top-notch. Similarly to the great sword with curved crossguard, they stick with the plastic material and the blood groove. There's also a lot of questions about future availability, because they're all sold in one pack. Does this mean that every future set that includes Sting will also include the Shards of Narsil? I mean, I'm all for that, but it doesn't seem like something LEGO would be very inclined to do. The grips on these swords are all very detailed, and the blade shaping is very diverse, but never stupid looking. My only gripe is those holes that appear on one side of the piece. Few other swords LEGO has produced have that problem, so what gives? I wish they could just be as smooth as the original 2011 weaponry. But that aside, they're a wonderful complement to the 2020 greatsword, and should give us great hope for the future of LEGO weapons. Now, before we finish, there's a couple swords I didn't cover, so it's time for a speed round. LEGO Elf Blade. Good, but not great. Hard for minifigs to use. Ghost Blade. Niche, but excellent. I own one, but I don't care to own more. Snake Skull Blade. The purple color really limits this sword's utility. I own three and have never done anything notable with them. Skull Cutlass. Too bulky for a realistic pirate sword, but I wouldn't be opposed to using one just for the captain of a swashbuckling crew. Foil. Good for what it is, I just don't care much about foils. Ninjago Blades Packs. Great for el ninjas and elves, not good for much else. Dagger of Time. Love it. I own about six and I wish I had more. Great for elves and for magic artifacts, but it's hard to equip an army with something this ornate. Barbosa Cutlass. Oversized, but otherwise beautiful. Lotus Pommel Blade. Nice, but the straightness of the broad blade is a bit strange. Worth owning one, probably not more than that. Sword of Gryffindor. The crossguard is nice, but the blade seems disproportionately small. It's okay, but not great. Skull Pommel Sword. I really want one of these, actually. Not useful to own a lot, but it would be really awesome for a skeleton commander or a necromancer. Raya's Squiggly Sword. It comes in sand green for some reason, otherwise it would actually resemble a medieval flamberge and be pretty desirable for medieval builds. Gamer Blade. This made me lose a lot of respect for Ninjago. Now, before we end, we're at 160 subscribers, which is actually amazing. Thank you so much, and if you appreciate this content, please consider subscribing. That's all, folks. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you later. Have a good one.